Alrighty, like I said, welcome to the monthly developer relations meetup. Uh, gonna start with the important stuff. We're gonna thank our sponsors, Contentful, um, an API first composable content platform, and a new sponsor, PlantQuest, uh, that is uh, a mapping SaaS for uh, factories and facilities and all sorts of cool stuff like that. Um, so this meetup is virtual and online. Uh, and we do that deliberately uh, because it's much more inclusive. There's lots of in-person meetups, but it's nice to have one that everybody anywhere can attend. Uh, and we're really proud to have had speakers from all over the world and an audience from all over the world as well. Uh, now, you can watch and listen anonymously. If you want to use the chat, uh, you should log in, and then you'll be able to post questions. Um, so what we'll do is when the, when the speaker is talking, uh, you can post questions, and then at the end, we'll have a discussion. We'll pick out some of the questions and put them to the speaker. Uh, OK, so this meetup is about developer relations. And it's about learning from each other and understanding the practice of developer relations and how to get better at it. Um, so that's why we have speakers on who have uh, lots of diverse experiences in developer relations, from those just starting out to veterans uh, like PJ and um, uh, charlatans like myself who <laughs> sort of fell into developer relations by accident. Um, but it's all to the good. And finally, thank you to Vito for hosting and for doing an upgrade today, which is really awesome. Thank you so much, Paul. OK, uh, how are we doing? How are we feeling? Ready to get started? Cool. OK. Uh, so let me introduce our first speaker, PJ Haggerty. So uh, PJ uh, wanted to give a talk about Ireland's history in the Eurovision Song Contest. But in the interest of uh, continuous professional development, uh, he's agreed instead to focus on the landscape of developer relations and developer advocacy in 2024. PJ is literally a rock star in DevRel, a co host of the Community Pulse podcast, an experienced musician experienced developer advocate, practiced in the art of selling the idea and function of developer relations to companies who have no knowledge of the power of what we do. And as they say, before the Eurovision jury vote announcements, PJ, you are good to go. All right, that good. I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're going with good to go and not the like 20 minutes of, of waffle that happens while they're waiting to do the ver the ver Eurovision announcements. But let me, yes. uh, let me get my slides going here. All right. All right. All righty. Let's see. I hit play. There we go. Can you All see right. me? Have fun. <laughs> yes. All right. Wait, I just lost my slides. Why did I lose my slides? Hold on. I can see all of my, like, it's like it erased all of my screens. This is super interesting. Okay. Let's stop sharing for a moment. Can you see my slides still? Uh, they are coming through for me. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. The state of developer relations. I was hoping not to take up all the time getting the slides set up. Uh, so I always like to set kind of whenever I do a talk, the 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 goal or what we're going to do. So here we're going to talk a little bit about the history, a little bit about where we are today, and a brief look at the future. The future part is going to be very speculative and opinionated. And if you had different your opinion, that's totally fine. That's why we have a discussion at the end. So a little history. Um, a lot of people think developer relations is a fairly new field, and it is and it isn't. It used to be that when a company or a product or a brand needed to have community interaction, they'd send one of their more like gregarious developers out in the world to do a talk or meet with current or potential conferences at a, at a, at a conference like CES or something like that. Yeah, your, um, your slides have gone again. Sorry. Okay. All right. No problem. Try one more time. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. It told me I stopped sharing my screen. All right. So let's try this again. I share my entire screen. You see? Yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. Alrighty. Okay. Continue. See, and then it does that. Why does it do that? Okay, so you can you see a black and white photo of a band? Yes. Cool. So we're in the right place. Um, 
So yeah, it's a new field. It's it's not a new field, but we think it's a new field. It used to be that we'd send out developers who could who could speak to people, but even earlier than that, it was often the creator of the software or the hardware who would be responsible to take the message out. The problem was not every company had a Steve Jobs, a Steve Ballmer, or even Bill Gates. Like most of these people were awkward and unable to deliver their message. They were building and frankly putting they were putting people off uh, on the things that they were supposed to be pitching. So it was kind of a sad situation. Uh, then in the 80s, this gentleman at Apple said, what if we actually create this idea of evangelizing what we do to the community so developers can get involved? And this was really interesting. And it kind of stayed in that like minuscule, tiny, if you were an extremely large company, you could do this bubble until the burst of the bubble around you know the late 90s. This is when startups began to, to grow. And the other thing that happened at the same time was the growth of open source. Um, and the growth of the uh, conference idea. So prior to that, you didn't have conferences unless they were held by large scale organizations like, you know, the Consumer Electronics uh, Show or or E3, which was even just a baby back then, which is a video gaming plat platform conference. You had to have something major and huge and expensive. Well, as the bubble burst from the first startup time in the late 90s to the beginning of the 2000s, you saw a lot of local places saying, hey, you know, we love you know, uh, uh, the Python language and we're all in Minnesota. So we'll do this do Python Minnesota and we'll create a conference. So things started to grow. As this growth started to happen, you couldn't expand on a founder or a single developer going out and speaking. You needed something else, someone else who could actually bring that message to the world. So meetups and conferences start to change the landscape in the same way that startups are changing the way that the world looks at technology. And it's becoming a global thing. Attracting top names and the best devs at a company to come and speak like, was super hard, but it was also super appealing. Um, companies started to see that they needed people directly in the role, but there wasn't a role for that. They were generally still leveraging engineers and just giving them time to go and speak. Um, and here we see why the flexibility of the startup really matters because startups can kind of create the ideas. So this isn't the distant past. This is like 2009. We start to see the idea of developer evangelism. It wasn't really called DevRel. Around that time, I joined the team at Engine Yard and we created what we called a community team. We were community engineers. Nobody had the right title. It was all kind of made up and we were all kind of seeing what would stick, but it was still based on the ideas of those guys in Apple in, in the late 1980s, early 90s. We still wanted to bring things out and do things. So we started to build and build and build and make it a bigger and better situation. Um, this is how DevRel came to be. Um, I, I, I don't lay claim to coming up with the idea, but a gentleman named Eamon Leonard and I started a team at Engine Yard. Um, we then later went on to train the folks at New Relic and train the folks at Twilio and train the folks at SendGrid on how to, commun how, how to interact with communities. And this became, according to Wikipedia, so it's not just me, according to Wikipedia, the basis of modern DevRel. And it became interesting because just a few years later, suddenly it became a checklist item. And you're saying, well, that's weird. So what happened was the startup scene was very much based on the concept of venture capital. And around 2014, 2015, the venture capital folks realized there's a big, important component there when we talk about getting people involved with community. Getting involved was paramount. The more people involved in the community, the more likely you are to be able to move sales and marketing things forward. Unfortunately, that's all they saw us as, is marketing and sales. DevRel needed to leave the confines of the engineering or community teams for better or for worse. We needed to incorporate more of what we were doing. Sales and marketing is a part of what we do, even though it's not our direct goal. And that's a key thing to remember as we talk about how things are now and how to move forward. So DevRel's in the limelight. And it, it becomes a checklist item. And probably a lot of you are looking at the picture on the slide going, "Why? what does this have to do with being a checklist item? So that is my friend, Tony. He's a developer at Roswell Park Cancer Institute here in Buffalo, New York, where I live. He writes code every day with the goal of curing cancer. He's not a scientist, but he writes code against that science. But when it came time to show that they had diversity in their scientific endeavors, they grabbed the only black developer through a lab coat on them and said, look, we've met this checklist. That's kind of how it was with VCs and DevRel. They said, you know what? Oh, we want diversity. We'll hire diverse people and just check it off the list. Doesn't matter if they're technical or not. We'll put them in a position and say, we have more women and more people of color in our organization. We have more people in DevRel because look, we, we hired one, one person. Check. Done. Checklists and bean counting is never the successful way to do anything. And that actually led to a lot of the problems that started to happen just before COVID. Um, 
So it's kind of interesting. We're kind of where we are today. Something that started at Apple in the 1990s, then was reformatted into what we know as DevRel in the late 2000s with companies like NGR and Twilio. And then we have a path that leads to developer relations as we understand it today. We see this as an evolutionary path that we've kind of continued on throughout the entire time. So what happened to kind of change things and shake them up so much between, say, I don't know, March of 2020 and now? And really, that's where I'm not going to go big into this, but where COVID really impacted us heavily. Conferences disappeared. The understanding of the value of DevRel changed. And there was also this like rise in, in a couple of concepts that really shook up what was going on in DevRel. And I'll get more, more on them later. But the one problem with COVID was we realized that a lot of people didn't understand what developer relations really was, what developer advocacy was. Many people said, well, oh, well, there's no conferences. There's no point in you traveling. You can't go out to speak. You can't go out and talk to people. We don't need you without realizing that developer relations covers so much more of that. We write content. We build blogs. We do Twitch streams. We, we educate people on how to do things. Conferencing is like, you know, maybe 10% of what we do. Um, some of us more, some of us less. But if you're a single IC at a company, it's just a little bit of what you do compared to all of the other things, all of the other content and educational products you're building to bring people into understanding what you do. That was a crazy thing. We had to kind of re-jigger re, re the concept, rebuild it so that people understood better. But that took almost the entirety of COVID. Um, so the state of DevRel today is kind of changing. So according to, there's been a few surveys that have been done, but the one that I, I really lean on is Common Room's Developer Relations Compensation and Culture Survey. I read that right off the slide because I never get that name right. It's a lot of words. But we've learned that there's more people that are practicing DevRel than ever before. This is amazing and positive, but it comes with some costs and some hurdles. And those are things we have to be aware of. Um, one of the issues is that we have a huge conflation with marketing right now. Um, I've said it repeatedly publicly. It upsets people, and I know that, and I'm sorry, but DevRel needs to work hand-in-hand -hand with marketing, but there needs to be, this is the key, an understanding that there are different end goals, and those need to be clear from the outset. Marketing's goal is to sell a product. DevRel's goal is to build a community around the concepts that support that product. That said, when terms like developer marketing start, become, start being added to the lexicon, people equate that to DevRel, and we begin to see developer advocate, technical content, technical writer jobs fall completely off the radar and an increase in people who are trained in classical marketing with no technical ability or no technical understanding. They've never written production code and they just stick the word developer into the front of the marketing. That's taking away jobs from DevRel. This is part of our problem right now. Um, the other big issue that we have is with sincerity. Um, we have an issue with the low percentage of people having actually written production code or worked in a production environment or worked in a tech position um, that, you know, they have difficulty proving how, how much prowess they have technically to organizations and founders who want to take their concept to developers. People that want to build communities want people that understand the community. Unfortunately, DevRel has become like a very attractive job and I get that. But at the same time, like, we need to do a lot of work. You need to kind of put in a lot of roadwork before you're the, the face of a company. That needs to be understood. We need to have that sincerity. We need to have that whole picture in order to deliver it. So when we deliver our content, when we educate developers, it needs to be about what the community teams, what the, I'm sorry, what the community needs, not what's best or serves the product or the sales team. Sometimes that's a hard thing to say. And this is another thing that stands in our way. We want to be sincere. That's our goal. We want people to feel that we are honest participants in the community, that we go to the community, not just to sell to them, but to educate them, to bring things up, not to lessen things. This is a difficult concept for folks who are outside of DevRel to understand. And it makes us a real easy target for budget cuts and reductions in force when it's time to like really realize what's going on. So what's the future? Um, one thing, we're going to focus on technologies that help build things, not, not technologies that help profit off of people. I've gotten into a lot of trouble for my statements about some of the nefarious uh, other technologies that are out there that really don't build communities, but build money off the backs of their communities. I'm not going to get into that. If you want to talk to me privately, I'm more than happy to have that conversation. But when it comes to the future of DevRel, there's few few things that are certain. You know, we have to ask, will the job market freeze up or break off into functions like, like it was in the beginning where it was very specific and siloed? Will AI for content creation force technical writers to lose work? I don't actually think this will happen for the record. I think there's 
maybe for documentation, it'll be a problem, but I think for like real blog posts and other kinds of content, script writing, things like that, we are not going to see that loss to AI. It's just not there yet. Ask me again in five years. The other question, will the community lead conferences or community led conferences continue to flounder? I don't know if a lot of people have seen this, but at least in the U S we've seen a lot of community conferences that formerly had, you know, five, six, seven hundred, a thousand people now struggling to get a hundred people through the door. And the question is why? It's just, no one's really sure on why. That question I can't answer. I can't answer. The one question I can answer is if we move forward with sincerity and we actually work hard to remember that we are educators working towards the betterment of the community, we will succeed. There's answers that we have to consider as we move forward. And everything is going to con con determine how we continue on and if we evolve. Evolution is the key to success in DevRel. So, DevRel's come a long way from the world where the person who invented the thing was the one who would talk about the thing. Uh, we've moved from the boardroom to the basement dwellers, from inappropriate booth babes and drunken cocaine-fueled parties, which used to be a thing, to codes of conduct, which is the best thing, um, inclusive events and after events, which is even better than the events being inclusive. And now we even have contract DevRel people who you can just bring in to do the things that you need them to do. DevRel has really diversified and made a better ecosystem of itself and made the, tech, the, the full technology spectrum better just by itself. So this is a different world of technology than when we kind of expected that we pushed Hello World to a screen for the first time. We should try to capture that energy when we talk about tech, when we write about tech, when we share it. We need that Hello World excitement. So go out, use your voice, bang the drum for the people who need it, and let them know you're here to share, to work, and to build a better place for them. There's never a need to be a star when you can join your community and your organization together as a constellation. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, PJ. That was, yeah. Uh, wow. <laughs> the history of DevRel in 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, an it's an abridged history. There's a much longer version. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So as host, I'm going to pick, I'm going to take the first question. Um, yeah, it is really painful seeing all the community conferences struggling. Uh, we just had a cancellation here. Yeah, I see that uh, you mentioned that in the in the chat there. Uh, and I, I mean that. I I feel it's because the the enterprise budgets are gone. It needs to support those. I think. Well, I think that you know I mentioned that the conferences used to be held by big organizations, and those big organizations like IBM and Microsoft and Google. They're going back to doing their giant events, and that's that's starting to catch on. Even smaller, well, I mean, not necessarily smaller, but companies like Datadog are doing their own conference. Um, IBM has specific divisions, like their AI division does a conference, and their cloud division does a conference. And you know, it's it's kind of a, an interesting thing where communities. I mean, you can't compete with that kind of money. It's too difficult. Um, so it's it's hard to say. All right, we're going to do this thing, and it's going to be small, and it's going to be fine. When I mean, and it's not just organiz, you know, big companies, but like. DevOps days, you can't really have a local DevOps meetup or a local DevOps conference without getting involved in the DevOps days global organization, which is a plus and a minus. It's it, it, it's a super tough balance, and I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I do see some surviving. Uh, I, I have a uh, really favorite little conference um, every year in Collusion of Poker in Romania that I always go to, which is Transylvania, by the way, right? Nice. Oh. Uh, the nightlife must be stunning. It's yeah. Well, we go to bed already. <laughs> uh, but the, it's called the developers, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's supported by a local company, and I think those conferences, if a company keeps them going, that's awesome. Uh, but the real community ones, where it's just people getting together, oh, man. So you have to have so much respect for the risk people take to make that happen. Uh, mm -hmm. It is, and it is awesome. So yeah, hopefully they come back. Let's take a look at a few questions. Uh, sure. And Mark, if you want to join in, uh, you are absolutely welcome. I'm gonna gonna go with. So Rena is uh, sort of musing on uh, the awful consequences of AI written documentation, and I know Mark, that might be a little bit unfair, <laughs> but um, there's there's potential and there's danger, right? I don't know. You did say five years. I yeah, I mean, I, I think when it comes to documentation, if you can teach the AI well enough, it's you're you're supposed to be relieving people of of their 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 job. Not I shouldn't say relieving their job, relieving them of their toil. That yeah. you, you don't want them to toil through building documentation. If you can get eight, it, it's kind of like Ruby on Rails in a way. 
if you can get AI documentation writing 90% of the way and you only have to do 10% of the work, great. That's exactly what it should be used for. Documentation but, on Rails. You heard it here yeah, first. Yeah, exactly. Well, they used to say Ruby on Rails. Rails gets you 90% of the way to building a web app in 10% of the time. Great. The last 10% is a real pain in the ass, but we'll, we'll ignore that last 10%. But like, it's the same <laughs> idea. AI, AI documentation could probably get you, right now, I would say it's more like 70% of the way. But even if it gets you 90% of the way, that's saving you toil. And that's the point of AI. I think the misunderstanding is that founders and CEOs want to be like, I'm replacing my entire workforce with AI. Yay, I'm saving money. It's like, no, you're you're not. You're yeah. you're kicking yourself in the in the pants. <laughs> that's a that's a bad idea, dude. Uh, we have Liz. Liz, good to see you again. Uh, do you think there are places where DevRel and Dev Marketing can work together? Hundred percent, one hundred percent. It has to happen. Um, like marketing at a tech company needs to understand developers, and if you have a developer who also understands marketing, great. The problem comes in when people say, well, I'll have one or the other. And this is often like a recruiter or, or you know, a founder or someone who's in the, you know, the C-suite going, well, I read this article and it said, which is always a terrible thing to hear from a founder. Um, but you need to have both things working in conjunction, not one or the other. It's, 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 it's a Venn diagram situation, not a single circle. Sinead, I know you had a question. Maybe you want to jump in. Also, um, great talk, PJ. Um, the Yetam had a question from one of your earlier slides. Um, was that a? Oh, I'm going to butcher. Yeah, was that was that a Fender Jazzmaster or a Jag? <laughs> um, okay, so if you're asking about in one of the first slides, the left-handed guitar was a uh, custom Jag um, from uh, the band The Happy Dogs, uh, which I was the drummer for. Uh, yeah, that was a miracle buy where someone had ordered a custom jag left-handed because they loved kurt cobain got the guitar realized they weren't left-handed sold it back to a music shop and my guitarist picked it up for about 500 bucks um it's a 1500 dollars guitar so that was a steal is what that was nice. and, and you're left-handed i guess so you can i'm not i am not left-handed i'm actually right-handed uh, okay. but in that band the guitar player was left-handed gotcha okay uh, mark do you have any question. uh, questions no no pressure Another question. That's another oh, question. Sinead. Yes, oh. go ahead. Right. The real question, and PJ, you and I touched on this um, the other day when we were chatting, and you mentioned uh, uh, earlier in your talk that you actually went to companies as well and kind of explained this and I can help you do this. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that is your dev rel and your dev marketing as, as well. Um, but like, how do you have ideas, apart from how you did it, but is there a, a more general thing? of there are so many mm. companies that are non-tech founded but actually when you strip back what they're doing they actually have something that can be applied to other use cases in other sectors so do you have any tips or even a starting point of how to um c communicate to these ceos or founders this is a whole other market for you and and and, and this is the first step that you need to take. Like, what would be the first step that these people should take? Yeah, I, th I think the the first step is is first of all uh, write write out your ideas, write them out. Maybe I mean, if you want to publish them as a blog post, great. That maybe that'll get a little bit of traction. Hopefully, someone that's in your audience will see it. But the biggest thing is write it out so that you have your ideas clear and straightforward. Then reach out directly and go to the places where those people are having conversation. Like I know I mentioned earlier, I, we were talking about Web Summit. I, I go to Web Summit a lot. Web Summit is very barely a tech conference. Um, like there is technology, but it's really more about money. Um, but you'll also meet a lot of CEOs and founders there, and you can have that conversation with them there. Um, meet them where they're going to be. Another great example, you know, Tech Barbecue is a great conference where there's a lot of founders and investors, but it's actually about tech. Um, but the, the whole idea is you can take these opportunities to talk with these people and and get their impressions. That's where I find out things like a lot of founders believe that AI can replace workers. But a lot of people who do AI don't agree with that. Um, don't really think that it, it they think that AI is a, is a is a toil replacer, is a work reducer, not a workforce reducer. And you know, if I didn't have those conversations, I'd be like, well, maybe they're maybe they're reasonable, maybe they're right. But you have to go to it's just like any kind of other community endeavor. Go to where they are. Even if it's just one on one and you have, you know, oh, your friend knows, you know, the CTO of Kellogg cereal, go have the conversation with them. 
you know, it, it, it can't hurt. At the very least, a one-on-one -on -one conversation will tell you where you need to challenge your own beliefs and where, you know, you think you can push forward and actually push on other people to, to understand the value of DevRel in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. It, it's always about community, right? It always comes back to community. Exactly. Mark, no pressure. I don't know. Did you have any questions for PJ at all? No, I just, I just wanted to align with that. I think, um, you, all of the, you can really look at any sort of AI as kind of like an abstraction and a multiplier for productivity. And it's like a tool to help things. I think a lot of people, uh, will mistake that, um, for, for replacement. And really it's kind of like when the calculator first dropped, they're like, Oh, this is going to replace all this stuff. But really it's, it's really just something that helps, um, make your life easier. And it's like, we, we released like in my last startup for Launchico, we built a startup website builder and we released a free AI logo maker and we open sourced the AI. Um, but really the whole idea with it was to, for people who didn't have necessarily the time or the capital to hire, hire a designer to, to kind of get them step one branding, a gr great starting point. And then like PJ said, you know, it gets you like 80% there. And then as you grow your business, you can go for that next like 15, 20% where you need like a more coherent branding. So it's like the same thing with documentation or, um, or anything. The idea is it gives you superpowers and gets you further along. Um, and it gives you a great starting point is the idea. So I just wanted to align with that. Cause I think, I think there is kind of a, it's like orthogonal almost how people view AI right now. I, I, yeah, and I, I concur with that experience as well. One last question, PJ, uh, and then we shall move on to Mark. So, and actually this kind of comes back to the conference question. Johannes is asking how important are conferences to DevRel in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, and, yeah. and, and I'm definitely gonna start with in my opinion, conferences are super important. And, and here's, the, here's the reason why. There's, there's, there's something about DevRel that, that puts you as a developer advocate or whatever your title is as the face of a company. Going to conferences and meeting people in person puts a face to that face. Um, when, when I first started doing DevRel like uh, in an official capacity at Engine Yard, I became the face of Engine Yard for five years. Um, one of those five years, I was no longer working at Engine Yard. That's kind of ironic, but like at the same time, people knew like, oh, that guy, he definitely knows about Ruby and Python. He knows about cloud. He knows about AWS. I can ask that guy that question. And other people who are looking to hire me like, oh, he does know about those things. Cool. Um, but a lot of that is based on the fact that like, oh, I met so-and-so at this conference one time. I can reach out to that connection to the point where like you, you are able to build a community of various communities. It's just a community of people that are, you know, your friends or that, you know, or that you, you know, have the opportunity to do things with later. Um, I've had, you know, I had the same experience back in, back in the olden day kids, there used to be this great platform called Twitter where you could do this and actually like make friends with people on the internet. You can't do that anymore. Now it's just to go rant about things. But, but if you'd like a blue sky invite, hit me up, it's getting better over there. But, uh, in all in all seriousness, like the the conference puts the emphasis on the actual humanity of what you're doing. It's not just this faceless corporation. It also comes in in handy when you know when you're like, oh man, I hate Engine Yard. They're stupid. Well, I don't think PJ is stupid. And I don't think the other people I've met there are stupid. So I mean, it can't be a stupid company, right? It humanizes the things that we do. Seeing people in the flesh humanizes it. This is one of the things that, you know, that uh, virtual conferences, like virtual meetups work, but virtual conferences at scale didn't really work. You need a hallway track if you're going through eight hours of content in a day. You need to be able to speak to a speaker. You need to be able to walk down the hall and see somebody and say, hey, did you see that talk about AI that Mark gave? That was awesome. Let's talk about that for the next half hour. And, you know, next thing you know, you're, you know, sleeping on each other's couch couches as you travel through the Midwest. I mean, that's not my story, but that's definitely things that have happened. Conferences humanize things. They bring the humanity back to technology. I think they are really necessary. Yeah, it's and it's interesting what you say about virtual conferences because, yeah. wow, they suck. <laughs> we should say that well, we're doing sorry. a virtual event, if right? If Paul's listening, Paul, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, but well, this format I think works, right? We find yeah, no, for the meetup, this is perfect. And Vito is great because it has an everlasting aspect to it. Like a meetup can continue to have conversations between physical meetups, and that's great. But you need that hallway track, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I've. I've one business, lost business, made friends, hired people, being hired. Wow. We met because of a conference, Richard. That is very true. Yeah. 
uh, one of the best ever. Thank you. The still was pretty special. Eamon's not here, right? I take full credit <laughs> yeah. for that. I, yeah, exactly. for that. Uh, I just wish I'd been able to take that uh, coffee giraffe home. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would have been awesome. Um, okay, cool. Thank you so much, PJ. 